All right, so let me start off by saying thank you, everyone, for coming. My name is Cody Armstrong, and obviously what we're talking about today is just tips and tricks in Onshape. Now, with the idea behind this webinar is we really wanted to put something together. It was just kind of a, a webinar about miscellaneous little things that you could miss. You know, maybe a lot of FAQs or you know, frequently asked questions, or just little things, subtle things in the interface that can help out. Um, so really, you know, forgive me now, this is going to be a lot of back and forth between just kind of miscellaneous tips and tricks that we've put together. Um, so that's the idea. As I always say with this webinars or any of these webinars, we really encourage you to ask any questions. There's a questions dialog and you go to webinar control panel. Uh, feel free to type in anything. I'll do my best to stop and address them. If I don't get to your uh, questions, stick around and uh, I'll make sure to address them all before I end the webinar today. So on shape tips and tricks. Now let's start digging into it. Now, before I get into the topic of the day, there are a few things I like to mention about Onshape in general. And the first is our mission statement, and that is getting everyone working together with CAD on any device anywhere. Now, if you haven't used Onshape on a mobile device, I definitely recommend it. We have a mobile app for Android and iOS, and it works on uh, iPads, iPhones, tablets, uh, Android phones. So you really have accessibility from anywhere. Um, so everyone working together with CAD on any device anywhere, that's our goal. Now. There are a few things about Onshape that I do like to mention before we get into the, the topic of the day. And the first is we do consider ourselves professional 3D CAD. And when you think of professional 3D CAD, it's really parts, assemblies, and drawings. Um, and we do have all three major pieces. The things that are unique about Onshape is the first off, you'll see us evolve very quickly. So roughly every three weeks, you're going to see new functionality being added to Onshape. Uh, but in addition to that, we also have built-in version control. Uh, so unlike a lot of traditional CAD systems out there uh, that need a separate data management solution, Onshape has version control built into its core. Um, so you can manage milestones in your design easily, and, and it doesn't require a separate software, a separate thing to manage. Also with Onshape, we have the ability to import and export common CAD formats. So if you've come from another CAD system and you have all these files, chances are we can read that data. Um, so step, I just Parasolid, SolidWorks, uh, Gatia, Inventor, you know, a number of different formats that I could list. Also with Onshape, we're introducing entirely new methods of collaboration. If you haven't shared your document yet, um, I definitely recommend it. There's a big share dialog in the top right corner uh, of a document in Onshape. And if you enter their email address, define their permissions, and hit share, uh, you can work with someone in real time. You, you can work together in the same model if you want to. Uh, so it's very easy to share, even if you just want to share with someone and allow them to view, you know, view only. Uh, there's a lot of different things that you can do with, with our collaboration tools in Onshape. So let's uh, dig into the, to today's goals. Now, as I mentioned before, you know, today really is just a lot of miscellaneous tips and and. Tr and you know, little tricks that we've thought up or little things that you could miss in the interface. Um, so just keep in mind, you know, forgive me now, I'm going to be doing a lot of back and forth is, you know, I go through my list of little things that have come up. Now, a lot of these are, you know, little subtle things in the interface. Uh, a lot of them are, are frequently asked questions, you know, things that we get asked a lot um, that we don't really have a, a specific place in one of our other webinars for. Um, we try to put them all together, you know, in this tips and tricks. So, real uh, real quickly, I tried to cope two intersecting pipes. I tried all the combinations of the command with no luck. The closest I came is I don't save the tool, but then one of the pipes is deleted. Um, forgive me, it, you know, th there are a number of things I could try, um, but um, it, it, it would depend on the geometry specifically. You know, bullions are the things that I would try at first, but, but you know, I... Without more details, it'd be hard to tell you more specifics. All right, so uh, today's goals, what we're going to talk about today, and as I mentioned before, it's really just kind of a, a long list of miscellaneous tips and tricks, but I, I do have some order to it. And the first uh, that I'd like to get into are just some miscellaneous tips about working with the web interface. Um, also. Uh, sketching some miscellaneous sketch tips parts and assemblies i have tips for parts and assemblies as well um, drawings um, a few miscellaneous tips and then lastly of course mobile so if you are using the mobile app i do have some tips that will help a lot in mobile as well um, 
So I do try and stick to some kind of order in this, but again, it's going to be a lot of back and forth. As I mentioned before, um, you know, feel free to ask any questions that you'd like. Um, as we're going through this, I'll do my best to stop and address them. All right, so let's dig into it. Now, I don't have a lot of slides. I want to jump right into Onshape. And one of the first things I want to mention, one of the most commonly asked questions that we get, at least from a new user, is do you handle you know, multiple monitors or do you uh, allow multiple windows open at the same time? And the answer is absolutely. You can have as many Onshape tabs open as you would like. Right? So I can have as many Onshape tabs loaded. And because, of course, they're just tabs in a browser, I can drag them to a different monitor if I'd like. Right, so you can place your assembly on one monitor and your drawing on another or you know, whatever you'd like to do in terms of positioning. But because they're just tabs in a browser, you can move them anywhere you'd like. So that's one of the first most commonly asked questions is you know, how do we uh, manage you know, uh, someone with two or three monitors? And the answer is just disconnect the tabs and move them to a different display. Now, uh, one of the other big benefits of this is you get a lot of the built-in browser functionality. So in, in my case, I'm using Chrome on a Mac, but I can do things like pin the tab or duplicate the tab. Um, these are useful functions just because, you know, it allows me to, in the case of pin, always easily get back to it. Um, but in the case of duplicate, I can simply duplicate a tab and maybe move it over to a different screen. So there's all kinds of neat things you can do just simply because uh, it's built into a browser. Now, uh, another thing that I'd like to point out is you can also, because it's a browser application, use the, the in the case of a Mac, command plus, command negative um, to change the size overall of the interface. Uh, and again, it's just, you know, built-in browser functionality. It zooms in, so to speak, but you can see if I go command plus, it zooms in just a bit and I can make the icons larger, right? So... If you want to make the icons larger or smaller, um, on a Mac it would be Command plus or minus. On a, on a Windows machine it would be Control uh, plus or minus, I believe. So you can change the interface icon size or you know the overall interface size. So uh, again, you know, just another tab in your browser. One other thing I want to point out is with regards to uh, global settings and and working in Onshape in general. Um, under manage account, one of the most commonly asked questions that we get is, how do I change the default units? So I, I'm going into my document and I'm changing from inch to millimeters all the time. How do I change it permanently so that I don't have to change it anymore? Uh, under your account settings, so if I go to my manage account settings, under preferences, you'll see the default units, the account setting units. And you'll see it's set to inch, but you can set it to whatever you'd like. And then going forward, every future document you create will default to these units. Um, so again, just one of the more commonly asked questions, how do I change the default units of Onshape? So that is units. Now, while I'm in the manage account, uh, one other thing that I want to point out again, it's just a commonly asked question. Um, what about something like a two factor authentication? You know, my bank or, you know, my email account has two factor authentication, which means a second factor to log in, not just my password. And we do support that under security. You'll see an option for two factor authentication, which you can enable. Uh, it will allow you to use two-factor authentication to secure your Onshape account. And if you're not familiar with two-factor authentication, um, it allows you to use a code, you know, driven by and oftentimes your cell phone, which um, gives you a second layer of security when logging into your account. So um, banks do this, you know, oftentimes you can set this up on your personal emails, uh, email accounts, and it's just an extra layer of security. All right, so one last thing that I wanted to point out about just the interface in general, you know, the web environment in general, uh, is trash. And it's one of the easy features to overlook. Um, by default, when you move a document or remove it, you're moving it to the trash. And you can, you know, build up a list here if you're not careful. Um, and it, you know, if you're using the free account, this will go against it. So make sure to empty the trash uh, as you, you know, if you really want to remove a document, you'll need to empty the trash. Okay, very similar to, uh, again, you know, um, 
desktop environment, you know, in the sense that when you delete something, it goes to the trash and then you remove, uh, empty everything from the trash to permanently delete. Okay, so now let's get into a few sketch tips. So I've got sketch tips up here. Now with the sketch tips, I'm just going to be going through just creating some basic shapes um, just to show you a few miscellaneous tips here. So um, let's get in. Now I'm going to start a sketch on the front plane. We'll go normal too. And I'll start with just a simple uh, center point rectangle. Okay, so I have this center point rectangle. Now my first tip is with sketch fillet. Uh, so one of the commonly used tools in the in the sketch level uh, tools is sketch fillet, and it's very easy to use. You know, you select sketch fillet, you select the point, and then you enter a radius. You know, so it's very simple to create a sketch fillet. Uh, but there's one little thing that's easy to miss with sketch fillet that makes it really powerful, and that is the ability to dynamically resize the fillet. So if I select sketch fillet, and then I left click drag that fillet, instead of just left clicking the point, a left click drag, I can dynamically resize the fillet. So if you're looking, you know, you don't know the actual size that you want at the moment, but you know, you you know, I want it roughly this size. You can left click drag to about the size you'd like, let go, and then enter your value. All right. um, so really neat tool, again, left click drag instead of just left clicking the point. Uh, and that's the big difference. And by the way, when you are in the sketch fillet and you do create a single fillet, every other point that you select in this case will also default to that same radius size. So you can enter a sketch fillet, enter the value, and then just left click a whole series of points. Um, and they're all given the same you know, sketch fillet radius. So that's a tip with sketch fillet. Again, left click drag instead of left clicking a point. I think that's the big thing. Now, uh, on that same you know vein of topic, there, there's also the, this left click drag concept in offset. So if I select an offset in a sketch, and I just left click a line, I get an offset of just that line, right? I can drag it out here, uh, left click, and then I have an offset of just the one line. But what if I wanted an offset of this entire, you know, chain of lines and arcs? If I select offset, instead of left clicking the line, I left click drag, I get an offset of the entire chain. Right? Left click, we'll enter the value, and now I have a one inch offset of that original contour. But the key difference there is again, just like the sketch fillet, I'm doing a left click drag instead of just left clicking an individual thing. If I left click drag, I get the entire chain of geometry, right? So I don't have to, I think a lot of users will go in and manually select a whole bunch of entities when they want to create an offset. If you just left click drag, it will automatically grab everything attached to the thing you're dragging from. So definitely a very useful tool, especially when you have more complex sketches. You know, when I have potentially dozens of, of lines and arcs, that can be a very useful one. Okay, so one other little tip, and this is a subtle one, and it's it's definitely for the new users out there, but one thing that's a little bit unique is you'll notice that the shade of the contour within this sketch geometry is different than the shade. You'll notice this is a, a white, this is a much you know darker gray, essentially. Um, with Onshape, any closed contours, enclosed uh, loop, so to speak, or contours will automatically be shaded a different color. And the idea behind that is you don't have to hunt for you know whether or not it's it's an enclosed contour. Oftentimes in many traditional CAD applications, you would try and extrude it, or you'd try you know one of the tools, and it would tell you, you no, know, you can't extrude this, and that's how you would find out that your sketch had an open contour. Um, with Onshape, it automatically shades, so you get a bit of a different shade. But then the big thing here is, you know, if this was open and you thought it was closed, it would be a different shade, and you it, it would immediately notice, you know, this is there's an issue here. So just a small thing, a, a little bit to the interface that helps you, you know, identify that this is okay to extrude, revolve, you know, whatever you're trying to do with it. Okay, so another tip. Um, 
showing constraints can sometimes sometimes be an issue. And you have the show constraints checkbox, by the way. Uh, I've mentioned this in the, the Sketch Tips webinars or the Sketch webinars. Um, but there's a show constraints checkbox here. And, of course, it turns on all the different constraints in your sketch. But as you can see, that can be really cumbersome. I've got all the equal constraints tying all my radiuses together. I've got all these tangencies. And all this stuff is automatically created because of the type of geometry that I was referencing and all the stuff that I was working with. What if I wanted to delete one of these? And you, as you can see, it can be cumbersome to find the one that you're looking for. Um, so show constraints may not always be the solution. If you have a really complicated sketch, you may want to find the constraints associated with an individual piece of geometry. And the way you do that is by hovering over it. So if I move my mouse over that geometry, you'll see the constraints appear. Now you'll also see every once in a while an issue where they disappear before you have a chance to mouse over them. So another big tip that I have is if you hold down the shift key, if I hold down the shift key, it will lock the constraints on the screen. So if you ever have trouble highlighting the constraint that you want. You know, as I move my mouse over it, it disappears. Or for whatever reason, if you move your mouse over the geometry and the moment you hit shift, all the constraints lock on the con on the screen and you can move your cursor over them, you know, left click and, and delete you know, that constraint. So the idea there is just making it easier to select constraints without having to turn on show constraints. Um, and the key is shift. As, as, the, as the constraints are highlighted, um, you'll want to hold shift down and that will lock them. Okay. All right. Okay, so the next one I have is the right to left, left to right. So let me just draw, I'm going to draw a simple circle out here. And I want to illustrate our one of our uh, easiest selection tools and, and uh, something that's that's been around for a while in, in many traditional CAD applications. So if you have experience with them, this will be probably familiar to you. And that is our selection. So for those unaware, you can, if I've wanted, for instance, to delete everything here, I wouldn't left click individual entities, I would drag a window. And if you haven't done that before, you just hold down the left mouse and drag a window and it highlights anything in that window. Now the question often then comes up, well, is there a difference between dragging right to left right, or left to right? And the answer is yes. And, and for those you know, paying close attention, you'll already notice a big difference. And, and to, to illustrate it one more time, if I drag from right to left, anything touching the selection gets highlighted. So notice the circle Although the selection was not completely encompass encompassing the circle, it still gets highlighted, right? Because it was touching the selection. Now, if I do the same thing from left to right, notice the circle does not get highlighted. And that's because the difference is from, from left to right, anything fully encompassed within that selection gets highlighted. Okay, so, again, you know, if you've come from a traditional CAD system, that is a big distinction. This really comes into play when you're in very complicated sketches and you're trying to highlight only certain things within a very complicated sketch. That selection difference um, will help. But again, left to right, right to left does make a difference. Um, you know, one fully encompasses everything, you know, that, that's fully encompassed gets selected, whereas the other, anything that's just simply touching that selection uh, gets selected. Okay. All right, so my next tip, let's delete some geometry here. So what I'd like to do, let's just create, I want to create a new ellipse. So bear with me. Ellipse. Okay. So a simple ellipse. Now, Another commonly asked question, especially for those trying to create um, something like uh, a loft contour, where oftentimes it involves um, very similar sketch entities. You know, maybe I'm creating a, a loft of a, some kind of a, or a bottle where it has this, you know, lofted contours between different ellipse profiles. And the question comes up, well, can I copy sketches and paste them into different places and reuse them, so to speak? And the answer is yes. Yes, you can. Now, um, one of the key 
aspects of this workflow is uh, inserting another plane. So this is you know somewhat specific to those you know creating lofted contours and things like that. But um, in general, lift uh, inserting planes is is useful to know. But um, the answer is yes, you can copy a sketch. So let me walk you through that now. Um, just to be a stickler, I'm going to add a few dimensions here to this first one so we know what dimension to dimension the others. So I've got my first sketch. Right? What I'd like to do is insert a copy of this sketch out here in space. Right? I want a copy of this sketch out here so I can loft between those two. Now the first step in that is of course creating the plane. I need to create a plane out wherever you want that to be and then copy and paste the sketch onto that plane. So that's the first tip that I have for you is just inserting a simple offset plane. So you'll see the plane command in the toolbar, select the reference you want. In my case, it's the front plane, but it could be any planar face. And <clears throat> excuse me, and then I enter an offset, right? So let's say I want a three inch offset, hit the green check, and now I have an offset plane. Okay, so now you'll see this plane construction plane, you'll see it in the feature list here as well. Now I have something I can paste my sketch onto. So kind of the first step in this process is that. Now, if you've already got a plane or if you're pasting a sketch onto another face, you don't have to do that step. Um, you'll just do the following. And that is right-click, copy sketch. And you can right-click it from the actual sketch or from the feature list. But I right-click the sketch and I say copy the sketch. And then I right-click wherever I want to paste it and I say paste sketch. Okay. And that will paste a copy of the first. Now the inevitably the question comes up, are the two linked? Uh, and the answer is no. Um, these two sketches have independent dimensions. Okay. So if I go into it, you'll see it's not constrained. I can change the values you know, of these dimensions. So they are not linked to one another. Now, if you want link dimensions, if you want that kind of behavior, I'd recommend the derived feature, but we're not going to get into that you know, as much today. Um, but these two are not linked. And, and the big thing with that is, you know, if I'm creating lofted contours, oftentimes they're very small differences between the sketches. Copying and pasting the sketches is very useful. Um, but again, you know, you need the plane. If you don't have a planar face, you'll need to, um, or a, a default plane, you'll need to insert one. But now I can select law, for instance, select the, the two ellipse profiles, and I get this nice loft between them. All right, so that is copy sketch. And again, you can right click a sketch, say copy, and then paste that into um, any plane or planar face. Now, another element of this is not copying the entire sketch, but copying only a piece of it. Um, so, for instance, if I wanted, you know, let's say, for instance, I had, you know, some other geometry referenced here. Let's do a center rectangle. And I had some other geometry for, let's say, a whole different feature down here. And I only wanted to copy the ellipse. Right. If I do a right-click copy sketch, it copies everything in the sketch. What you can do is you can right-click the ellipse, and you'll see an option to copy the sketch entities. And this allows you to, of course, copy sketch entities and then paste them either into this sketch or into a whole other sketch. Uh, so you can copy and paste. You know, if I created this really complex shape in a sketch and I needed to use it in three or four places, rather than sketching it over again. Uh, you can right-click, copy, right-click, paste. But that the main difference there is you're not pasting the entire sketch, but rather entities within it, you know, pieces of the sketch. Okay, so I am almost out of uh, sketch tips here. I'm going to duplicate the tab, and there's one last. I don't know that it's necessarily a tip, but it's definitely one of the underused uh, functions and something that we run into quite often um, and that is when we're talking about um, sketch images 
And the question often comes up, can I bring in an image and use it to drive my um, sketch? And the answer is absolutely. Um, so here's an example. The key thing with this is you must first import the image into your document. Right, so here is a um, bicycle frame that I'm designing, and I have the pedal, an image of the pedal, and I want to use that image to drive the profile of the pedal to actually mo model this, um, you know, to create a model of the pedal based off of the image. Now, the key thing, as I mentioned before, is the image must first be imported into the document. So you'll notice I have a tab here for the image, that PNG file that I've imported. It could be bitmap or JPEG, a number of different formats are, are supported. But the key thing is first import the image into your document. And then in the part studio that you want uh, to create this in, let's jump back to the frame. While in a sketch, a new sketch here. You'll see insert image. Okay, so you can insert image. It'll allow you to choose the image from the document. You select it and then just draw a rectangle. Okay. And it will place the image. So um, very easy to do. The rectangle drives everything. The rectangle, defining the rectangle dimensions drives the picture size. Um, you can delete the constraints. There's a horizontal constraint there, and I can rotate the image around if I wanted to. Um, so really, the, the rectangle kind of drives everything with the image. But then you can trace it. You can do whatever you'd like um, and, you know, and actually placing it. And if you're just looking for a way to add you know, an image to your model, this is another way. It doesn't go away. So if I hit the check, you'll see I have, I'm left with the image in the model, even if I didn't create a feature off of it. So that is sketch image. By the way, you can also do the same thing with DXFs. Uh, so if you have a DXF and you import it in the document, you can also import that DXF into a sketch and create geometry off of it. All right. So see any last sketch tips I think that is it for sketching let's move on all right so jumping back real quickly um, into some part modeling uh, tips that I have here and, and some of these are a little bit more specific to the interface so forgive me but um, one of the first is a commonly asked question do you have an undo and of course we have an undo here in the top left corner but one thing you may not know about undo is if you right click you'll see a list of all the recently created features. So let's jump back here. Uh, if I right click, you'll see all the recently created features. And this is just since I opened my session here, but um, right clicking the undo will give you a list that you can go back to. Okay. Um, so just a, a small thing, a little tip that's easy to miss, the right click menu when right clicking the undo, you get actually a list of all the different um, options. Okay. Um, another selection tip, if I select a whole bunch of entities and I realize I don't want them highlighted anymore, spacebar deselects. So that's the tip just in general. The spacebar deselects anything that you have highlighted. Uh, just, this is a bit of a tangent, you know, not necessarily specific to parts, but in general, the keyboard shortcuts, for those not familiar, uh, is under the help menu. And one neat tip about the keyboard shortcuts is there's this little pop out. So in the top left or top right, excuse me, corner here, if I select this pop out, it actually becomes a separate uh, browser window. And the neat thing about this is if I'm just learning the tips, I can take this separate window and put it on a different monitor um, and, and just leave it up. Right or you know print it or whatever I'm trying to do. So it, it's a neat way to leave up the keyboard shortcuts when you're trying to learn them initially. Um, it becomes its own browser window. Okay. But if you're not familiar with it, the keyboard shortcuts, you know, really a powerful thing in Onshape, and you can find them all under the Help menu. All right, all right. So let's jump into another example here 
All right, so I want to get into a few part tips, and one of the first that I have is uh, things like mass um, or materials or measure. These are all often commonly asked questions. How do I measure or how do I tell how much it weighs or my design weighs in, in on shape? How do I apply the material so that I can tell how much it weighs? Um, and so I want to cover a few of these. One of the easiest ways, and the first thing I want to cover here, is assigning a material. So in a part studio, you'll see I have this seal retainer modeled. I want to assign the material. You'll see part one in my feature list. If I right click, you'll see the option to assign material. Um, so I get material and I can choose from a long list of materials. Now, as of today, there's not a way to create your own materials, but that's something that we're working on. Um, you Right now you have a, a list, a fairly long list, um, but it is fixed. So... But again, you know, the idea behind it is you can choose your material. Let's choose 6061 aluminum. Uh, you get some details about the density. I hit the green check, and now that material is applied. And, of course, the main thing there is I want to be able to tell how much this weighs. So if I select the part, and this is um, getting into the mass, if you select the part, you'll see a little mass icon in the bottom right corner. If you left click it, it will bring up the mass properties of that part. Okay, and it will tell you the mass, uh, the center of gravity or center of mass, moments of inertia, surface area, and so on. Um, you can even select a make connector as a reference for some of these things. So for the moments of inertia, for example, it's very useful. So um, mass properties, very useful thing. The key thing there is it's subtle. If you select a part in the feature list, you're going to see a little icon in the bottom right. If you left click that icon, it will display the mass. Now, of course, the mass is dependent on having material assigned. So it's kind of a two-step process. You gotta assign the material, but then you see you can see your mass in the bottom right. Now, on that same vein of topic, you know, the question often comes up, well, what about measure? You know, what if I wanted to measure this whole size or the distance between these faces, for example? Um, measure is not a separate button. The neat thing about Onshape is you can just select the geometry that you want to measure. So for instance, this edge and the measurement automatically appears in the bottom right. So any highlighted geometry, uh, the measurement automatically appears in the bottom right corner, very similar to the mass I was just showing you a second ago. And it, I can take this you know, to several different steps. So I can left click the face and left click the face, and now it shows me the distance between those two faces. Right? If I left click, it will even give me more specifics, like the deltas and things like that between the two. So you get a lot of information just by left clicking. There's the, the surface area. You know, So uh, select this and I get radius values and um, parallel axes and diameter values and so on. So um, the measure is integrated. There's not a separate command for it. You just left click the entities you want to measure and it appears in the bottom right. Uh, okay, next tip. Okay, this one is a popular one. Um, not many know that you can move the feature list. You can move the feature list. You can even move um, the cube. The cube you need to highlight and drag. Um, but you can move the cube. You can move the feature list around if you don't care for the location. A question, can the black lines and circles used to highlight edges of a part be hidden? Um, I believe you're referring to the render mode, and, and we, you can choose a shaded without edges render mode. And, and you will not see the black lines to detail the edges. So yes, we do have r different render modes for not, those not familiar. Under the cube here, you've got uh, hidden edges visible. Um, you've got hidden edges removed. Even a translucent. Okay. So lots of different render modes. Shaded will show the black lines defining the edges. All right, so next tip, um, final. This one is definitely a very powerful one. Uh, again, one that's underused and I think a, a neat one. One of the questions that we get asked is, is there a way to, when I'm sketching, see the end result instantly? Um, and the answer is yes, there's a button while in a sketch that will allow you to see the final end result live. 
Um, so let me show you an example of this. Here I have this squeegee design, and I've created this loft. Let's jump down to it here. Loft 4. And this loft is meant to loft between, of course, the handle and the squeegee itself. So that's the loft transition. And if you look closely, the loft is driven by guides. So I have these four sketches that manage the transition between contours. And this final is useful throughout any features that you create, but I really like it in the sense of, uh, of something like a loft because it's something you might change a lot and, and tweak a lot and you know, may not get it exactly the way you want it the first time. So let me show you what I mean. If I edit any sketch, and by the way, again, you know, not specific to lofts or any, any feature in particular, um, in a sketch in general, after you've created a feature, you're going to see a final button here. If you click, if you left click final, it shows you the final end result, but you can still edit the sketch. So now I can play with my loft contours and watch them update, right? You'll see that loft update. If I pull this up, I can see that the lofts will update accordingly, right? So if you want to go into your sketch and change it and see how it affects the feature live, turn on final. Okay. Again, I think it's really useful in the case of you know these guides and a loft, but it could be any feature. You know, if you have this simple extrude and you want to see what happens if I change this to this, you know, you can hit final, change it, and it will update live for you. All right. Uh, question: How does Onshape work with a 3D mouse? Right now, it works with Windows um, and a 3D connection specific mouse. So um, it's really dependent on the hardware vendors to write a driver that supports it. Uh, 3D Connection has. So if you're a Windows user using a 3D Connection mouse, you download the latest driver, it will work with Onshape. Um, you know, I've heard rumors of them developing a Mac version, uh, but I haven't seen it yet. So uh, it's not publicly available, at least. I have heard that they're working on it. So just keep in mind that those are 3D Connection specific devices. Uh, another question, can we add texture onto a part surface? The answer is no. Um, we can't specifically texture. You can, of course, change the color. Um, if I right-click a part in the list, you'll see Edit Appearance, and you can change the color. Um, but that's not, of course, a texture. What most people consider a texture has you know, a little bit more detail to it. One thing I want to point out, though, is we do have the Onshape App Store. Uh, so jumping back here real quickly, on your document page, if you go to the App Store, there are many rendering apps that you can add textures to your model and even render them, you know, with, with all kinds of cool backgrounds and things like that. So definitely check out the App Store if you're trying to create a nice, you know, rendered version of your model. As of today, in Onshape, it's really just colors. You're just applying colors as appearances. Okay, so next tip. Let's get into this one. So another commonly asked question, um, and this is just in general, not necessarily specific to part modeling, but often used in, in part modeling, um, is can I compare you know, the, my model today to my model six months ago? Or can I compare, um, for instance, you know, revision A to revision B? You know, is that possible? within Onshape? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, let's jump back to my documents page. Here we go. So the neat thing with Compare is it's built into Onshape. It's not something that you have to launch separately. Um, and you can compare anything. So I can go into the history, you know, from six months ago and say, okay, let's compare you know, this, this model, the way it sits today to that moment in history. Uh, but another commonly uh, used function here is comparing uh, versions. So here I have a version created called Revision A. This was a major milestone in my design. I can compare today's model, the way it sits today, to revision A. And the neat thing about this is it will give you not just a graphical slider showing the differences, you know, a graphics preview of the differences. It actually gives you a breakdown 
feature by feature breakdown of the differences. So if you're looking at if you're looking for a very granular, you know, I want to know exactly what's different between the model today versus six months ago. What's changed? It will give you that, and it'll tell you this sketch is not the same. If you if you left click a feature, it will tell you what's not the same, right? So if I left click extrude, it shows me that the extrude in main is 20 millimeters, but at revision A, it was 22 millimeters. So it gives me a feature by feature breakdown. I can select um, these light, you know, this fillet for instance, and it tells me that in main it's only four edges and they're four millimeters. In revision A, it was six edges and they were five millimeter radius. So again, a very specific, and, and you also get a list of what's in one version and not in another. So you can see fillet 7 only exists in revision A, not in main. And you'll see chamfer 1, for example, only exists in main and not in revision A. So you get a really specific breakdown. Uh, you can compare any moment in history, as I mentioned, so you can go back six months and compare it to that. You can compare versions like I'm doing here. You can even compare branches. So if you create two different branches of a document, you can compare the two before you merge them. As I mentioned, you get a list, but you also get this nice graphics slider. So you get this nice graphic showing you the transition between the two points in, in, in your model, right? In this case, two different versions. Okay. So that is compare and a, a definitely one of the underused tools, but very powerful capability in, in Onshape. So let's move on. I wanted to get into just a few assembly tips, so bear with me for a moment here. I want to open up casting fixture. So when you're getting started with assemblies, there are a few things to keep in mind, but probably one of my biggest tips is the group command. Um, the group command has you know a lot of powerful capabilities in the sense that you don't really have to mate nearly everything. There are many assemblies in Onshape that because of the way they were designed, um, you can have several hundred parts and you know two or three mates. You know, mates are really about the motion, and that's because of the group capability. So let me point out what I mean. Now, if I have a blank assembly like I do here, and I insert a few parts, so let's jump into uh, the hydraulic components here. So I've inserted all of these at once, and that's because they were all modeled together in a part studio. So when I drop them into the assembly, they just come in in that order. Now, of course, they are not mated. And what I mean by that is this is an assembly and these things are not mated to each other, right? So if I left click and drag, everything kind of falls apart. So the idea behind it is we need to constrain these. And, you know, with an assembly, it's all about movement. You know, how does this thing move around? But not everything moves, right? And for those things that don't move, you can group them. So let me give you an example. By the way, just another aside, just another tip. When you first start your assembly, you generally want to fix, you know, some part in it, right? In my case, the cylinder here, it's also floating. It can move around as well. So I want to make sure to right-click and fix the cylinder, right, so that it can't move. But remember, all these other parts, although they look like they're in the correct position, are not actually constrained. So the O-ring is in the right place, and it doesn't move, right? Rather than mating the O-ring to the cylinder, when it's already in its correct position, I just simply group them. So I select group, I select the cylinder and the O-ring, and the two are now grouped together. And you can group hundreds of parts together. So if you have um, you know, an assembly that only really has two or three moving parts, but hundreds of other parts that are stationary, they can be grouped and you do not have to worry about mating them. Right? You just group them, green check, and now the O-ring is fixed relative to that cylinder, and it can't move. Now these other parts, of course, have motion, so I cannot group them. And that's another important tip about group. If it moves, you do not want to group it. Right? If there's if there's motion, you do not want to put it in a group. Um, unless, of course, you know that entire group is moving. So 
Now, that's the first tip, of course, is just in general. The group command, you know, it's one of the underused. It's one of the things that um, a new user sometimes struggles with. But just think of it as, you know, fixing all of these parts relative to each other. Now, another tip. Um, let's add a quick mate here. I want to do a cylindrical mate between this cylinder and the bore here. Now, another tip is, you know, um, how do I control the limits of motion? You know, what if I want to restrict the range of motion? Um, and how do I know how much to restrict that range of motion? Um, one of the first tips that I have is while in a mate, you can grab and drag. And what's neat is it will actually show you the distance. So if you look real closely there, you'll see these numbers appear showing me the distance between mate connectors. So I've defined a cylindrical mate. I left click and drag and I can see, okay, you know, that's where it hits. That's where it hits. And I find out my range of motion, right? Once I find out that value, I can enter it in the limits. So you'll see a little checkbox for limits. You can check it and then enter your minimum and maximum values, and that will stop the part from moving uh, that far, right? So another commonly asked question, you know, how do I keep this part from going all the way through another, for example? That's one we get often, and that would be with limits. Now, just another, again, another tip is if you're trying to find that range or that minimum and maximum, you can drag the part and move it around, and that will give you an indication. Okay. You can, of course, use measure and measure between the parts, and, and there's a number of techniques, but showing the mate values while in the mate is, a, is definitely a useful one. Okay, so another one. Um, this one comes up quite often. Is it possible to see the interferences between parts. So here I've got, you know, the cylindrical mate and if I drag this all the way up, it is clearly conflicting or interfering with another part. How would I see that? How would I know that? And and the answer to that is is the interference is actually built into section view. So if I do a quick section view, I select a, a planar face and I say okay, section view and then I grab my arrow and drag it. You'll see any interferences highlight in red. So while in the section view, if you're dragging through a section view and you see anything in bright red, that means those two parts are interfering, right? They're conflicting with one another. And you can see it's live, so if I if I grab this and move it, the entire thing turns red. And so I can easily, you know, if I added a limit, I can say, oh, the limit's going too far, I need to adjust the value, and so on. So um, the the interference is built into section view. You just grab and drag, and when it hits, it turns red. Okay. Um, so again, you know, the ability to test the limits, or in general, if you just want to section and then see if there's any internal conflicts between parts, you can do that as well. Uh, is it possible to change the color of the command buttons? The answer is no, not as of today. Uh, right now, we don't. We have a limited ability to customize the interface. You can move the feature list and the view cube around, but there's really no customization to the toolbars themselves. And the another question: Can we change the interference color? Uh, again, no. There's no setting to control the interference color as of today. All right, so let's move on. Another one, another commonly asked question, is it possible to copy and paste parts? I'm going to get out of section view here. Um, yes, you can. Um, you can Command C, Command V, um, or in Windows, it's Control C, Control V. So I highlighted the O-ring. And I'm on a Mac, so it's Command C, and then I left click and space Command V um, to to insert. Uh, just another tip is you can also use Snap Mode to very quickly assemble uh, parts. So if I wanted to very quickly assemble a whole bunch of parts at once, I can turn on Snap Mode, and then instead of you know, left clicking or selecting the mate, left clicking, left clicking, I can very easily drag one over another, right? And it automatically mates to it, and I can define my mate type. So it's a very easy way to attach um, one 
you know, part to another without first pre-selecting the mate. I just turn on snap mode, drag one mate connector over another, and it automatically mates them. Um, will they look into changing colors for these items in the future for colorblind users? That's something that we're definitely looking at. In general, customization and options. Um, the the big thing with the customization options, things like keyboard shortcuts um, and colors and things like that, is we want to make sure that that not only do they apply when you log in from your current workstation, but any computer that you log into. So you have the same flexibility to go anywhere and have all the same options go with you. Um, so it's definitely something that we're working on, customization of the interface in general, whether it's keyboard shortcuts or toolbars or whatever it is, is definitely something that uh, we're working on. All right, so moving on, my next tip uh, is real quickly, um, follow mode. And follow mode is a useful tool. It's very easy to miss, um, but it's a very useful command for collaborating with others. Uh, so what I'd like to do is share this. Let's share this document. So if you haven't shared your document yet, very easy to do. There's a big share icon in the top right corner. You click it. You enter their email address. You define their permissions, a very important step. right? Do you want to give them the ability to edit or just simply view? Right? They can't change with view. So I want to give someone else access. By default, every document you create in Onshape is private. Um, but in my case, I want to share this, so I click share. And the neat thing, uh, let's share this with someone else. Gmail.com. So if I share this, the neat thing about this is that person is instantly able to see my document. Right? They don't have to do anything special with installing applications or managing um, you know, someone else's download. They get instant access, and you get feedback that they're there. So if you haven't shared your document yet and you know done some real-time collaboration where I go into a document and you know I can see everything updates, so we can even work together on building this assembly. You know, I can insert a part, for instance, you know, and you'll see it live update. Right. So now we're working in the same assembly at the same time. You see the person that I've shared with has inserted another plunger. We can work on the same part, work on the same assembly, or we can work on different parts or assemblies, but we can see everything update in real time. Right. So I don't have to wait for someone to save or check in or do anything like that. Um, I just share the document and we're working together in it at, the, at real time. Now, one thing that's easy to miss here is what's called follow mode. And so when you're in a document together like this, you'll see that I get the little visual cue that they're in the document. If you double click that cue, you're then looking at their screen in real time. So it's very useful if you're trying to highlight, no, this is the hole that I'm referring to, or you know, this chamfer, this fillet is too small, right? And maybe I'm on the phone or I'm just trying to show someone this is the thing that I'm talking about. It's very easy to do with follow mode, right? We're both in the document, I double click his icon, now I'm seeing his screen. And then I can say, okay, you know, that is, you know, the feature that I'm referring to. So follow mode, again, you just double click their social cue, right? The little icon here in the top right indicating that they're in the document and you're looking at their screen in real time. Okay. Another neat aspect of this is if you left click in space, it will take you to the same model orientation. So now I'm out of follow mode, but I'm looking at the same at the same model in the same orientation that I was looking at on my collaborator screen a second ago. Um, so that's one big tip that I have is is in general follow mode. If you're sharing a document, you double click, you see their screen in real time. When you create a part, are the mates created automatically or does the user create them as needed? You, you create the mates when you assemble it. Uh, so when you create your assembly, you either mate it or you group it, like I was referring to before. But they are not created automatically. Now, the mate connectors that you see when I go to create a mate, those are created automatically. Those little white points are automatically created. But you can create them yourselves. Um, but you do need to actually go in and define mates for your assemblies for the motion. Is this available internationally or US only? This is available internationally. Um, so Onshape is available um, all around the world. Okay, so moving on. 
Okay, so uh, I have just a few uh, drawing tips. One of my first drawing tips, um, when you're creating a drawing, let's create a new drawing here. I'm going to go to create drawing, is the custom template option. So if you're just getting started with um, on-shape drawings, I'd recommend starting with an on-shape template. It's kind of generic, but a pretty standard ANSI or ISO drawing template. Um, it's a good place to start if you if you really don't have anything. But if you want your own custom template, you can build them on the fly. So I can build an ANSI size C with you know first angle projection if I wanted to. You know you can do all kinds of different things. So you can kind of build your own uh, custom template with all these different settings, um, even one with no views at all or even no title block. Right? Do not include a border. Oftentimes people want a drawing with just the geometry and nothing else. This is an easy way to do that. Um, so you can build your own custom template. Now you can also import a DWT file. So if you have a DWT template, you can use that in Onshape as well. Uh, just import that into a document and you'll see it as an option. But this allows you to build a custom template on the fly. So it's one of my first tips and it's definitely one of the um, cool things that was recently added to drawings. Now, another tip, let's jump back into a document with a drawing here, um, is the properties. So in your drawings, you have property options. So you can set the text size globally or the number of decimal places globally, or no, I shouldn't say globally. You can set the text size for this drawing. You can set the decimal places for this drawing um, all here. So you're not changing individual dimensions. You're not dependent on what size uh, the units or the text was in your template, for example. And so you can change a number of different settings in the properties. Okay, so that's another tip that I have for drawings. Um, another one, this is a commonly asked question, it's easy to miss. Do I need to create separate tabs for every single drawing in the document, right? If I have a dozen um, parts in this document. Do I need a dozen different tabs for every drawing? And the answer is no. There's a sheets, the very first icon in the toolbar, and you can add more sheets. So you can add as many sheets to a single drawing as you'd like. It's very common to have the assembly and then all the parts in different sheets within the same drawing. Okay, but you can organize it in that way. You do not need separate tabs for every, uh, every drawing in your document. Um, let's see, another one. This one is a very common one. Okay. If I create a note, I can copy and paste that note. Okay. Um, very similar to the um, copying and pasting parts. Uh, control C, Control V, Command C, Command V on a Mac, um, but you can copy and paste notes. Very useful if you're doing a lot of very similar notes in different drawings. You can copy and paste them. Okay, um, okay. we have just a, a couple minutes left. Um, one last drawing tip, and then we we'll move on to mobile. You can export all your on-shape drawings um, if you with a right click. So if you right click, you have an option to export, and you can choose DWG, DXF, or PDF. Okay. All right, my last tip is using Onshape Mobile, and I have just a few minutes to do it, so bear with me. If you haven't uh, downloaded the Onshape app, I definitely recommend it. Uh, it is a very powerful tool. Um, and it's not just a viewer. You know, if you're familiar with many traditional CAD applications, the, the mobile applications are generally just a viewer, maybe a markup capability. With Onshape, you have you know the real CAD editing tools uh, in your browser, right? So here I am editing a mate inside of the assembly, right? I can jump into um, any Part Studio, any uh, tab, and go in and edit sketches. Okay, so I can go in and edit sketches and and change dimensions and do all of this from a mobile app. So again, just kind of highlighting, if you haven't tried out on shape on a mobile device, again, it's not just a viewer. You can really create models and assemblies um, using your phone or tablet. But just some tips regarding its use. So if you're just getting started with it, to manipulate, to move things around, just real quickly, um, single finger drag rotates the model. Right? Two finger drag pan. 
So two fingers down and drag pans, and then you use pinch to zoom. Just so just like zooming in on a web page, if you pinch in, pinch out, it zooms in and zooms out. So those are the easy things. You know, how do I manipulate the model? How do I change things around um, within the feature? Now, um, then we get into a little bit more specific stuff. So um, just in general, a few tips that I have. You have the ellipsis menus in the feature list that give you the ability to edit, copy, and do all the things you would do in a browser. If I jump into a sketch, for example, um, one of the biggest tips that I have for mobile is tapping with two fingers. So if you tap the screen with two fingers, you get a context menu. And it's very useful for editing a sketch or exiting or copying, but I like it in particular for view normal to sketch plane, right? Because then I can select, I can select, you know, view normal to sketch plane and use that as a reference. Okay. Okay. So that is uh, just a few tips. One last tip: if I hold down my finger, I can pre precisely select. Forgive me, uh, features. So if I wanted to select an individual circle, or if I wanted to draw another circle on the center of these, I'd hold down my finger, precisely select with a tap and hold, and then I can create my circle. Okay. So again, tap and hold brings up a precision selector, and you can move your cursor over the entity you want to constrain it to. Okay. So those are just a few mobile tips that I have. Um, we have run out of time, so forgive me. Um, I'm going to stick around and answer any questions that you have, so bear with me for just a second here. Um, going forward, if you're just getting started in Onshape, I really encourage you to try it out and let us know what you think. Um, really encourage you to try Onshape in your professional work and, and give us your feedback. There's a feedback tool built in to help. Uh, it's very easy to give us feedback, and we really encourage you to do so. We really want to hear what you think. Also, share. Invite others. I, I've shown you how to share. Um, you can collaborate in real time. You can work. You know, one person can be working from the desktop. Another person can be working from their phone. Right? So you can collaborate with people even on mobile devices. It's, it's um, definitely very powerful stuff. So definitely encourage you to share your document. Uh, even if they don't have an Onshape account, we create one on the fly for them. Um, also, if you're interested in establishing a local user group or maybe you're interested in meeting local users, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to help you set things up. So that's what I had. Um, I want to say thank you, everyone, for joining. I'm going to stick around and answer any questions. So I see a few there. Uh, bear with me. Um, but that's it, everyone. Thank you and have a good day.